Hello, everyone. Matt Clark, research analyst with Money Markets here. We've got your weekend bull and the bear podcast. Uh, joining me, uh, as always on the weekends, is chief investment strategist Adam O'Dell, as well as Green Zone Fortunes co-editor Charles Sizemore. We'll get to them in just a second. Um, but first, I do want to remind you that uh, you want to head over to moneymarkets.com after you're done watching this video, uh, if, you, if you haven't already. Sign up for our free daily e-letter uh, every day of the week, including Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, Charles, Adam, myself, our entire team, uh, we work very hard to make sure we're giving you safe, sound, simple, and smart, profitable information uh, for your portfolio. And you can uh, check out that information each and every day, moneymarkets.com. And then you can get a free daily e-letter sent to you every day that has all that information right there for you at your fingertips every single morning. So make sure you do that. Just head over to moneymarkets.com. Now today, uh, we're going to go back on track, as I like to say. Um, you know, Last week, we told you about uh, the three different COVID-19 uh, vaccine providers uh, and kind of gave you our take on each one of those. Uh, very happy to do so. Uh, but now we'll kind of go right back into what, what we uh, have typically done, and that is each one of us are going to give you uh, our credible, uh, you know, buy recommendations for you, uh, the stocks that we've been looking at this week and, and that have caught our eye and tell you why, uh, give you some background behind it and, and let you know what that is. And I'm going to start off today uh, with our chief investment strategist, Adam O'Dell, has been working very, very hard on a, on a myriad of things going on uh, within Green Zone Fortunes and Money and Markets. So Adam, uh, welcome first off to the Bull and the Bear, uh, as always, and uh, tell me what's, uh, what, what's on your mind uh, this week. Yeah, thanks so much for having me again. Um, so we're going to go fishing in the genomics industry. And uh, to put that in layman's terms, basically anything DNA centric, any medicine, uh, biotech that is uh, centered on finding cures and treatments and therapies and diagnostics by using the human genome uh, or genome of other organisms as well. But basically, it's DNA medicine. And so that's where we're going fishing today. Um, I've written probably at least half a dozen articles, if not more, about one uh, ETF that basically was a little, little known. Not many people were talking about it. It had less than $500 million of assets in it for the past several years. And then in 2020, it absolutely blew up in a good way uh, and attracted about $8 billion worth of uh, investor inflows. And that's the, uh, the ARC Genomics Revolution ETF, A-R-K-G is the ticker symbol. Uh, Kathy Wood is the CEO, CIO, and, and founder of, uh, of ARC. Uh, funds. And so basically, she's got a ton of press. Their flagship fund is ARC-K, which is a, a more broad innovation, disruptive innovation ETF. Um, but I've been really hot on ARC-G for quite a while. Um, I've written about it twice this year. I wrote about it three times in 2020, uh, specifically in January and February before the runoff. And I even recommended this fund, uh, ARC-G, in October of 2019 at an investment conference where I was speaking. And I basically said that DNA is the future of medicine and uh, genomics is the future of, of biotech. And uh, if you want diversified exposure to these, uh, these up and coming uh, genomics companies, that ARC-G is a, is a great, simple, diversified, one click way to get access uh, to that space, which is really going to be growing faster than anything else out there. Um, so that was back when, like I said, the fund had about 500 million in it and now it has 8 billion in it. Um, it's getting a lot of press uh, recently because they've had some outflows and uh, the, because the ETF has pulled back about 25%. Uh, I kind of pulled back to its 200 day moving average. So I recently wrote an article where I said that, I, you know, I would back up the truck right now to absolutely buy this dip, dip in ARC-G. And I think it's a tremendous buying opportunity for the long term. Now, I, I do want to, the individual pick that I'm giving today is kind of a playoff of a, we got a, we got a user that wrote in and he was very shrewd and he went to the Money Markets website and he downloaded, not from our website, but from the ARC website, the, the individual stock holdings within the ARC-G ETF. And he, one by one, ran those individual stocks through the green zone stock rating model. And he wrote to me and he said that actually the holdings in ARC-G don't really rate that well in green zone, yet you've talked about ARC-G and you've put genomics picks in, into your green zone newsletter. You know, what gives? Why, why don't they rate well? And the simple answer is, is, is that biotech stocks don't tend to rate well on our model because our model is backward looking and it looks for companies that have a, a longer and more stable history of uh, earnings and revenue growth as well as, as the other six factors that we look at. And uh, so a lot of the biotech companies are newer. They have uh, either unproven earnings or unstable earnings. Uh, it's a lot of ones and zeros. Either they don't get approval for the FDA uh, for their tri FDA trials, or they do get approval, and then they get a huge pop in their share price. So um, I'm not surprised that uh, the companies that are in RG don't rate that well in the green zone. So you have to kind of look beyond that, and you have to kind of look strategically rather than uh, quantitatively and think, you know, is this the future of healthcare? Is this the future of medicine? And I absolutely believe it is. 
Um, so I've actually just done a presentation on that that we'll share with you in the show notes. Um, but we're basically talking about the geno genomics revolution and uh, four of my top individual stock picks within that um, space. But to answer that that gentleman's question is, you know, why don't these stocks rate well? I answered that question, but I want to do get I do want to give a stock today that does rate well in that ETF ARCG. And that's simply because this is an established company. Uh, it's Thermo Fisher Scientific, ticker symbol TMO. And uh, Thermo Fisher has been around since the 1950s. They're based in Massachusetts and they're a $181 billion company. So this is not uh, some small startup that just that came about in the past five or 10 years. This is an established company in the healthcare medical devices uh, industry. They make reagents, they make laboratory equipment, uh, consumables, instruments. Uh, diagnostic materials, media for, for culturing different uh, things in the lab. So they basically are a supplier of all the raw materials of things that scientists and, and uh, clinicians use to diagnose and, and to do uh, you know, laboratory research. And so um, we've absolutely seen great growth rates out of uh, Thermo Fisher recently. Earnings per share um, over the prior quarter most recently were 150% gain. Um, so this stock rates very well, um, and it rates almost uh, better than any other stock in the ARCG ETF, and that's mainly because it's well established. So just to give you an idea um, of the six factors it rates highest on, it uh, gets a 99 out of growth on growth, a 96 uh, on quality, and a 93 on volatility. So again, this is a fairly low volatile stock. Um, it has a very quality book and earnings. Uh, the profit margins are in the, in the high teens. And uh, it's growing revenues and sales and cash flows very strongly, especially for such a large established company. Um, so right now, the stock is basically trading. Uh, it pulled back recently to its 200-day uh, moving average, right just above the $450 uh, level. And it's kind of traded sideways at that level for the past two to three uh, weeks. So I would definitely be a buyer of this dip uh, in Thermo Fisher, ticker symbol TMO. And I think that you can uh, have some access to the genomic, genomic space uh, but in a more established player. And like I said, we'll link to my presentation on genomics, but I have basically put it my, out my top four stock picks. Uh, they're a little bit more speculative, uh, but one of them is currently in our green zone portfolio and it's already tripled since May of 2020. So I think that if you want a little bit more juice, definitely check out that presentation. Otherwise, I don't think you can go wrong with uh, Thermo Fisher TMO. And I agree. I think Thermo Fisher is a great company. We're very well established, fairly diverse, uh, does a lot of great things, and it's uh, had a pretty solid trajectory. Um, for, for me, I, I'm going to start by throwing out a couple numbers to you. Uh, and, and they're not necessarily going to make sense together uh, separately, but when I put them together, you'll understand where it comes from. The first number I'm going to give you is 50,000. Very common number, you know, not pulled out of anywhere. Uh, the second number I'll give you is a little more specific, 78.5 billion. So not, not a whole lot of relation there, but let me put it in context for you. Um, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, about 50,000 Americans died in 2019 from opioid-related deaths. And we've all heard in the news in terms of the opioid pandemic where uh, you know, people are getting addicted on pain medication after surgeries or, or, or following procedures, things like that. Uh, and it's become a, a very... Uh, a very big thing in terms of news companies are, uh, you know, settling for, for millions and billions of dollars uh, because of, of their participation in this opioid crisis. Now, the second number comes into play because the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, estimated the total economic uh, burden of prescription opioid misuse in the U.S. is about $78.5 billion per year. That includes healthcare costs, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and even criminal justice or law enforcement involvement. So there's no question that the opioid epidemic has, has hit every state, uh, many communities, uh, many people, uh, you know, you, you know of someone or have family members or whatever who have been adversely impacted by, uh, by, this, uh, by this opioid epidemic. And like I said, countries uh, or companies rather have uh, manufacturing these opioids uh, with what I would imagine would be the good intentions to start, but then turning things you know, into a negative light later, have settled in court again for billions of dollars. These are, these are settlements to states, local government entities, and even individuals who have taken these companies to court uh, in Oklahoma, here in Florida, uh, and, and I, I think at last count there are about 28 states that have, have, have been you know, working in, 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 uh, in the courts uh, against these companies that manufacture these opioids. Now, my, my recommendation today is, is counter to those companies uh, that have manufactured opioids for pain management. Uh, 
Uh, the company that, that I'm recommending today is Pacera Biosciences Incorporated. Uh, this company trades on the NASDAQ and its ticker symbol is PCRX. So that's uh, Paul Charles uh, Randolph X-Ray for to mix up the phonetic alphabet, uh, which makes no sense. So, but it's PCRX. It's a biotech company uh, that specializes in developing non-opioid pain management and regenerative health uh, for clinics, surgeons, hospitals, various places here in the United States. One of the most successful products uh, is a, is a is a product called Exparel. That's E X P A R E L. It's a non-opioid, single-dose local anesthetic uh, that's used at the time of surgery, and it's aimed at reducing or eliminating the use of opioids for post-surgical pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, if you're going in for a procedure uh, that involves uh, you know, any kind of surgery, they give you a local. Uh, it, maybe it's not one of those things where they have to put you under. They give you a local, uh, and that, this local is a non-opioid local. So it, it still numbs it, gives the surgeon the, or the doctor the ability to do what they need to do, and you don't have to worry about having prescription uh, opioid medication uh, after, after the fact or very limited in, in, in scope. Now, the company estimates that it's had nearly 8 million patients use Exparel as of January of 2021. And this is a drug that has only been around for just a couple of years. So to have 8 million sur uh, patients use Exparel is, is pretty remarkable. And the results are pretty solid. They've seen a 78.4% uh, drop in opioid use when they were testing this drug uh, initially before the FDA gave it its approval. Now, the company is expecting a pretty massive jump in its total revenue over the next three years, and I think that's a lot to do with the use of Exparel. I think you're, you're going to see Exparel used a lot more across a lot more clinics in, in the United States. In 2016, the company reported total revenue of about $276.4 million. That's expected to reach $710 million by 2023. That's a 157% growth rate for revenue. Uh, the company's earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization, or EBITDA, as it is more commonly known, is also expected uh, to, to massively rise in the coming years. The company reported its EBITDA uh, at a negative 19.2 in 2016. So it was actually, its earnings were in the negative. That's expected to jump to 339 to the positive by 2023. Uh, in 2020, it was 71.4. So between 2020 and 2023, 375% jump in its EBITDA, uh, in its EBITDA growth uh, over in just a three year period of time. Now, another financial uh, stat for the company that I looked at was its net income. Uh, Pasira's net income has been negative from 2016 to 2019. They weren't making any money. Uh, they were spending a lot on research and development, trying to develop Pasira, uh, the, uh, the Exparel and, and other therapies that they have, <clears throat> pardon me. But in 2020, uh, the company uh, reported net income of $145.5 million, that figure, will be around 237, close to 240 million by 2023. So it spells out a, a lot of strong growth for the company. Uh, now the stock price uh, for, for Pacera reached a low of around $30 per share back during the coronavirus crash in March of 2020. Since then it's seen uh, some ups and downs, uh, but it reached a 52 week high of more than $78 in February. That's 168% bounce uh, in a little under a year. Those gains paired back slightly. The stock uh, is priced at around $70 per share, which I think is a nice opportunity if you want to buy what I would consider to be a very small dip in this price uh, before it, I think it's going to shoot back up and surpass $80. Uh, but as Exparel anesthetic gains in popularity, more and more clinics use it amid the fallout of this opioid crisis that we've been facing in the United States. I think that share price is only going to get higher. Uh, its stock price over the last 12 months is around 111% up uh, compared to pain management biopharmaceutical sub-industry, uh, which its average growth is only about 94%. Compared to the S&P, uh, US BMI, Pharmaceutical, Biotechnology, and Life Sciences Index, which is an index of uh, all the S&P stocks that are in those particular sectors, uh, the growth is probably further illustrated. The index has grown only about 29% in the last 12 months, whereas again, Pacera is up 111%. Uh, and that means it's performing far and above its peers. Now, I use Adam's six-factor green zone rating system. Uh, Pacera Biosciences rates an 81 overall, which means that less than 20% of all the stocks that we rank are actually higher. Uh, it's a massive takeoff. It's a massive takeoff in sales, makes it a strong growth stock. Pacera also has uh, strong returns on investment, assets, and equity, which are all in the green, whereas the other biopharmaceutical industry averages are in the red. Uh, it does rank low in value, but its price to ratios do fall pretty close in line with the industry averages. Um, it's, its volatility and momentum rankings are also in the green. 
uh, even with some slight fluctuations in its stock price over the last 12 months. But overall, its leadership in creating non-opioid pharmaceuticals uh, really puts it in position uh, for a lot of future growth. And as a smart investor, I think you can see this as a trend, uh, as, as a solid trend, and you want to make a play for Pasira Biosciences now. So again, it's Pasira Biosciences, traded on the NASDAQ. The ticker is PCRX. That's my pick. Uh, now we'll head over to Charles Sizemore, who uh, is, is going completely out of medical, if I understand right. Uh, not even touching medical at all. No biopharma, no biotech, no nothing. What uh, what stock uh, has has caught your attention this week? Yeah, I, I just I spend too much time in doctors' offices. You know, I have a new baby in the house, so just anything medical related is just not really anything I want to deal with right now. Not I'm going a very very different direction. Um, going with financials, and there's a very simple explanation for that. Uh, my biggest theme of this year is simply normalization. Just the world going you know, closer to normal. And a big part of that, or a big beneficiary of that, is going to be the financial sector. You know, look at last year. Large companies did fairly well for the most part. But small and medium-sized companies and mom and pop businesses, you know, sole proprietorships, whatever, uh, kind of, you know, Main Street America really just struggled to, to hold on. It was just a year of survival. And that's, that's spilled over into this year a little bit as well. But that's it, it, it's ending you know we're vaccinating two to three million people a day there is you know, perhaps another small wave forming with some of these variants but the, the the pandemic is ending like shot by shot by shot it, it's ending that's really good news for main street america they can get back to business as usual so what does that mean it means they're taking out loans for new construction for remodeling for expansion, um, you know, if growing businesses need larger revolvers, um, yeah, what else? Just anything under the sun. Mm -hmm. Moving beyond business, look at consumers. You know, consumers are, you know, they're already, we're not back to full employment yet, of course, it's still gonna be a while till we are, but uh, the dark, dark days of the pandemic are long over. Uh, people have been re-entering the workforce here. Um, our unemployment rate is higher than we'd like, but it's dropping pretty quickly. Um, more people spending more money. You know, there's finally stuff to spend money on. For the last year, you could buy stuff on Amazon. That was pretty much all there was to do. Um, there's a lot of pent up demand. There's going to be a lot of credit card swiping here. People taking trips over the summer. People, um, you know, staying in hotels. People going places. Just doing stuff. All of this is good for the financial sector. It's for every credit swipe, every, I, I guess there's still people that write checks. I was gonna say every check written. I, there's like three people left in America that still write checks, but they're gonna be writing more of them over the next year. Um, all of this is, um, it, it points to a good, healthy um, financial sector. The market tends to anticipate these things. Financials have actually been doing really well in 2021, along with energy, they're one of the very best performing sectors. So uh, this week, I'm going to be kind of a tease here. I'm going to recommend a large cap financial that I like, one that I think it's, you could be a long-term holding for you. You could buy it, hold it, collect the dividend, just, you know, not really look at it that often. But this is more of a tease for, um, in Green Zone Fortunes, we're going to recommend a financial as well in the coming month. It's going to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit higher octane play. I'm not going to tell you what it is, of course, but uh, I will share with you uh, the teaser pick today, which is uh, J.P. Morgan. So J.P. Morgan is, of course, one of the largest banks in the world. It's widely considered to be uh, the best run bank on Wall Street. During the last financial crisis, 2008, J.P. Morgan suffered. The whole sector suffered, of course, but they suffered less. They navigated that crisis a lot better than most of their peers. They have a great management team led by Jamie Dimon. It is uh, the blue chip in this space. So looking at uh, Adam's uh, Green Zone ranking model, it rates a, uh, a 65 overall. Well, that's not that I mean, that's not that high, but it's definitely in bullish territory. Anything over 60 is bullish. And why, did, why isn't it higher? Well, the last several years have been the all technology, all the time market. If you want something that rates really high, that's in the large cap space, it's 
I can't say it's exclusively tech, but it's almost exclusively tech, right? This is an old school stock. Uh, old school stocks have not really been as in favor, but 65 is, is still solid. And importantly, it rates well across the board. The only uh, category it does poorly in is size, and that's just because it's a large company. That is to be expected. It rates really well across the board. So digging into it, its highest uh, individual rating is volatility at a 77. And that's um, noteworthy because if you remember, banks were quite volatile um, during the last, last crisis. So what happened? Why, why is JP Morgan uh, rating well based on our volatility score? Well, part of it is the time frame of the model. And this is kind of getting into the, the nuts and bolts of the model here. We measure, our, our measurement period across most of our metrics here can be as short as a couple months or it can be several years but we don't really have anything that extends beyond about 10. You know, that's kind of a hard stop for the model. And so a lot of the, the wildly volatile stuff of, of the last real crisis, that's, that's not being reflected in the numbers, which, which is good. It shouldn't be. Like that has passed. That is a different uh, market uh, regime, if you will. So uh, it, what, what does a 77 rating on volatility tell you? This is a steady eddy stock. This is a, a bank that is quite conservative that just plods along, you know, there's not a lot of drama with it. That's good, we want nice low drama stocks. Uh, value at rates, it rates high as well at a 70, and that's, um, that's not surprising. Um, banks and energy companies really have been kind of the key value sectors in recent years. Uh, that's really hurt them because investors have really run to the sexy, glitzy tech stuff but that's changing, and this year tech has not performed as well. It, it's it's one of the the worst performing sectors, honestly, because people have been rotating, they've been taking those profits in the companies that did so well last year, and rotating into value stocks. So the high value rating here at seventy is something I'm very excited about. I think that's that bodes really well for the stock. At the same time, this this company is no growth slouch. It rates a sixty seven on growth. Uh, that's good. Now, of course. The base was pretty low on this. You know, starting several years ago, the banks were in a mess. I mean, they have been growing steadily over the last couple of years, but they were growing from a, a relatively low base. That's okay. I actually do think growth will, accel growth will accelerate over the next uh, couple of years here. Again, from this normalization trade, this the economy getting back to normal, while the Fed and Congress are still throwing a lot of money at the economy. Moving on, it also rates very well on quality at 66. Um, I, would, I would argue that uh, for the most part, banks do get penalized somewhat on the quality score because of their high leverage, their, their normal high leverage. That does penalize them a little bit. So I think you could argue that this is actually a higher quality stock than the 66 rating suggests. But even if 66 is the number we're going with, that's still pretty darn good. Um, finally, momentum. It, it doesn't rate exceptionally well on momentum at 64, but it's not bad. And, and to, to rate even in the top half based on momentum, considering what the market has done over the last several years is actually pretty impressive. So um, yeah, I, I do like, I don't, I don't like to catch falling knives. So if I do see a stock that rates well on value, it rates well on you know, quality, it rates well on everything except momentum, and it's trending lower, I, I, I tend to sidestep it. I really like to see a decent momentum score. And this certainly makes the grade at, at, at 64. Uh, if there is you know, any, any knock on the stock, it would just be uh, the size score, it rates a zero, uh, wh which means it rounds down. If it's in the top one half of 1% of companies by market cap, it's gonna round down to zero. Um, in our system, but that's okay. Um, yeah, not every stock in your portfolio should be a, a small cap dynamo. Yeah, you do need a few steady eddies in there. So you know, overall, you know, the thesis here, again, this is a conservative, uh, solid company. It's one that's not gonna give you a lot of drama. It is benefiting from the normalization of the, the post-pandemic world here. It's, it's, this, is, this is very much a reflation, getting back to normal trade. And, It'll keep your, uh, it'll, wet, it'll wet your appetite for uh, what we're putting out in Green Zone Fortunes next week, or not next week, sorry, in the coming month.
So that's uh, JP Morgan. That's uh, Charles recommended JP Morgan. I've gone with uh, Pasero Biosciences and uh, Adam has gone with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Just to kind of wrap all that up and uh, real quick, 30 seconds for each one of you uh, parting shot for the weekend. Adam, what's, uh, what's your parting shot? I mean, one thing, one thing that came to mind uh, as we were all pitching is that um, this is the idea of a barbell approach. So some people have asked me, you know, is it, you know, should you go to only small cap stocks or should you go with the big steady eddies? And I think by mixing the two, by, you know, covering both ends of the barbell, so to speak, uh, you can really get a balance there. You can get some pop from the small caps uh, on the ones that do well. You can get some ballast or stability from the large caps. So I think, you know, mixing like my pick and yours, Matt, is kind of an idea of that. Uh, mixing something like a JP Morgan versus a smaller regional bank like we're uh, going to be recommending in this upcoming monthly issue. It's kind of the barbell approach. So I think that's kind of a theme that came out of this week that's uh, important to think about. Very good. Charles, 30 seconds. What's, uh, what's your parting shot for the weekend? Uh, I, I just piggyback on that. You know, uh, small caps are going to give you better growth over time. Uh, that really is where you want to be with the more aggressive part of your portfolio. But as you, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. That can be more volatile. So uh, it is good to have a mix for sure. Very good. So that's a, that's a recap of our, of our picks, our parting shots. I will tell you that in the show notes below, we, we will uh, put that link in uh, where you can link to find Adam's uh, three genomics picks uh, that he thinks are going to knock it out of the park. Uh, and, and also, don't forget, if you haven't signed up for Green Zone Fortunes, that is a perfect opportunity for you to do so, and you'll be able to find out what Charles and Adam are thinking uh, next month with the uh, uh, issue coming out uh, that, that will feature a financial, in, uh, a financial stock of some kind right? I, I, I'm not going to give it away. That, that's as much information as I'm going to give. Uh, so I, I know it, but I'm not going to tell you. So that, that's, you just have to wait, sign up for Greens on Fortunes, and uh, you'll be able to find out what that is. And because uh, uh, just like with money and markets, Greens on Fortunes, uh, all of our services, we want to provide you with safe, sound, smart, simple, profitable investment information for your portfolio. The entire team works very hard across all of our services to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, and uh, you want to make sure you jump on board. Uh, log on to moneymarkets.com or actually just head over to Money Markets. You'll have to log in uh, and uh, check out all that information uh, that we have for you that is, is free. Uh, you can sign up for our free daily e-letter where you get all the daily uh, information sent to your e e uh, inbox daily for free. Uh, you can do all that at moneyandmarkets.com. We've got much, much more coming up. If you haven't noticed here on our YouTube channel, if you're on our YouTube channel, you, you've noticed we've added some things. Uh, we, we, we've taken Charles Sizemore off his leash and allowed him to do a little bit more in terms of video. Uh, but you can check out his Investing with Charles series uh, that, that comes out each and every week. Also, uh, if, if you want to pick the brain of the man who started it all, our Ask Adam Anything series is the place to do it. It's where I get to sit down with Adam and I get to ask him questions that we get from our, from our readers our viewers and these are great questions we've had some that are are, are real uh, ones that really dive into adam's thought process and, and those are great to have he, they, he's also been asked about different uh, uh sectors in the market things like that you want to check all that out that's all on our youtube channel if you're not subscribed make sure you do subscribe to money and markets on youtube hit that notification bell and get notified each and every time uh, we put out a new video so lots of stuff on the way lots of stuff in the works like i said the team is working very hard uh, to make sure we are giving you safe sound smart and simple profitable investment information for your portfolio so for green zone fortunes co-editor charles sizemore our chief investment strategist adam odell i am money markets research analyst matt clark until next time everyone safe trading